So I want to thank all of you for coming here to, to be with us and discuss clean energy. Um, and we really want to make it a, a discussion. So we've discussed amongst ourselves and decided that uh, we're going to uh, have shorter present individual presentations. And then I'm going to lead a discussion among our group of experts here about clean energy. And then we're going to open that up to the, the full group. So hopefully we can get a lot of the expertise in the room involved in the discussion. My name is Sean McCon. I'm the uh, chairman of the board of Fundacion Avina, um, and uh, this is a Latin American foundation. We're going to be talking about clean energy today, um, and I don't know how many of you like sci-fi. I'm a big sci-fi fan. I find it more real than reality sometimes. And uh, working in energy, Avina uh, uh, focuses on energy in Latin America as one of our primary areas. Uh, lots of times I, I feel like I'm dealing with the matrix. And I think that if you walk outside of this room, you will feel like you're walking into the matrix in the sense that our societies still haven't really adapted to the idea that we need to transition to a clean energy matrix, that we can't burn all the oil that we have right now, that the climate is already changing, and that technologies are available so that we don't need to have a fossil fuel uh, energy matrix at all. They're competitive. It's happening right now. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I don't know if you know this movie, but in The Matrix, basically there's a scene where the hero is presented with two pills. And one pill is a red pill and one pill is a blue pill. And he's told, listen, you can take the red pill. If you take the red pill, you're going to have to uh, confront harsh reality, which you'll have the opportunity to change. But it's difficult. Or you can take the blue pill, and you can remain blissfully ignorant, but the, the path, on the path to de destruction. And I feel like most people have taken the blue pill. <laughs> but I think that if you're in this room, it's because you've taken the red pill. And that <laughs> we, have the, uh, we have the ambition to transition to a clean energy matrix. So we're going to start from there. We're not going to prove the case. We're going to assume that you all have taken the red pill along with us and that you have that same ambition. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, if this session is going to focus uh, a lot on Latin America, as I mentioned, uh, Fundacion Avina is an, a Latin American foundation. And uh, coming to international events, lots of times I'm surprised that not everybody is at the same level of understanding about Latin America or is very familiar with Latin America. So as a sort of a, a co build context for the presentations of my colleagues, I want to talk a little bit briefly about Latin America. Um, and uh, before, but before I get into that, I'm sorry, I should introduce the panel. These are our panel of experts. Uh, that know much more about energy than I do. Uh, I'll start off with Tasso Azevedo. Tasso Azevedo is a social environmental entrepreneur. He has a background in forestry. In fact, he started uh, Ima Flora, which is uh, one of the uh, most important certifiers of, of wood products in Brazil. He then moved into the government, where he was the uh, chief of Brazil's National Forestry Service. Um, and he was in the government when he became the architect of the national plan to combat deforestation in Brazil. And I'm sure if anybody, uh, any of you accompany what's been going on in Brazil in the last 10 years, you'll know that that was a very successful program. He was also one of the architects of the national uh, uh, climate change policy for Brazil. And he brings uh, expertise about working through government channels to change policy and also the perspective of Brazil, of course. Um, we also have uh, with us Sara Larraín you know, from Chile. Um, Sara is the uh, executive director of uh, Programa Chile Sustentable, or the sustainable, uh, the sustainable Chile, the pro, the pro, the sustainable Chile program. Sorry, um, and uh, she uh, has been v from civil society. She's been very 
important in shaping policy and government in Chile. And there's a long list of things that she's contributed to, and I'm going to have to make the list short. But uh, she uh, was one of the co-authors of the National Energy Efficiency Program in Chile. She uh, was one of the people responsible for a law in, in Chile, which says that by 2025, 20% of the energy matrix in Chile will be uh, renewables. Uh, she was actually responsible, or one of the people responsible, for the creation of the environmental ministry in Chile. So she brings uh, a lot of experience from the Chilean experience, uh, perspective, and also from civil society and how civil society can make big scale changes in policy uh, in government. Uh, and we have Dipender uh, Saluja. Dipender is a veteran of the uh, Skull World Forum. Uh, he is the managing director of the Capricorn Investment Group, which is part of the Jeffrey School constellation of organizations. It's a $5 billion uh, fund, um, a managed fund. He's got 25 years of experience in the technology sector. Um, a lot of the fund uh, focuses on energy. Uh, it's a significant energy portfolio. And I think he really helps bring uh, some global uh, tie-ins to this group which focuses on Latin America, but he can sort of place that into the global context and also bring an investor's uh, view of, of clean energy and the challenges there. So let me, let me give a little bit of a short introduction to energy in Latin America before we go zoom in specifically on Brazil and Chile. No? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, please sit on either side. Sorry. <laughs> Look at the, my back. Um, so Latin America, it's uh, 600 million people, half of China, if you want to look at it that way. It has a GDP of six trillion. Um, in terms of, of uh, population and GDP, it's uh, half or over half is, is in Brazil and Mexico. So you have two giants in the region. That's very important to say. Uh, if you look at the, the social project progress index, in terms of social progress, Latin America, by and large, comes out pretty well. In other words, the countries, in terms of social progress, are generally a little bit above the trend line uh, uh, in compared to the rest of the world, with some important exceptions. And there's some outliers, like Costa Rica, that are way above the trend line in terms of their GFP, uh, G, uh, GMP. It's also important to say that Latin America is predominantly democratic. I mean, a lot of the, the countries in the region, some more so, some less so, but the dem they're democracies. And that's really important when you talk about policy solutions to, and policy change in areas such as clean energy. Um, and then looking at, of course, uh, Latin America is known mostly probably for its environment because it's an environmental powerhouse. Uh, in terms of environment, you have to speak in superlatives. It's got the uh, largest uh, reserves of fresh water. It's got the largest uh, concentration of tropical forests. It has the largest river in the world. It has the driest desert. It has the wettest forest. It has you know, just amazing wealth, 50% uh, of the world's biodiversity. So it is a, a natural resource powerhouse, uh, which is one of its defining characteristics, I would say. This is uh, the ecological footprint of the countries in the world. I don't know if you're familiar with the Global Footprint Network, but basically they have a very interesting methodology. It's sort of an accounting that they use where they compare the bio capacity of a country with its annual natural resource use. And they can compare those two and they can see, well, are you using more than your bio capacity can replace year to year? And if you look at Latin America, if you take out Mexico, uh, really, it's, it's amazing. It stands out on the map, along with uh, parts of, of Western Africa, as, uh, as a, uh, a region that has been able to keep its development within the limits of its natural resources. And you say, well, how has that been possible? And the way it's been possible is because, first of all, they have huge natural resources. You know? uh, so that's a good starting point. Second of all, in terms of demography, it's uh, the, the demographics, the population are, are in, uh, in comparison to the wealth and assets pretty much uh, 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 allow the, the, the countries to, um, 
to have this sort of uh, efficiency in terms of, of their uh, natural resource use. Um, and then also, by and large, if you compare it to l other parts of the world, the, the energy mix is cleaner than you find in a lot of other places. Um, and I'm sure some of my colleagues from Latin America will correct me on, on aspects of this. But if you compare it to the world, I mean, for example, in Latin America, if you look at global greenhouse emissions uh, in Latin America, most of that comes from la land use changes, not from energy. And if we look at other parts of the world, usually the, uh, the majority of emissions comes from energy and not from land use changes. And so until very recently, I don't know if that's changed in the last few years, but most of the greenhouse emissions was from deforestation and not from energy, although energy is fastly, fast gaining on uh, land use changes. On the other hand, you have to look at the vulnerability of the region. And this is uh, especially in terms of climate change. And this is a vulnerability map to climate change for the world. And obviously, Latin America is not the worst off. But when you look at its natural resource wealth, you have to question how climate change is going to affect the Amazon forest, how climate change is going to affect the fresh water from glaciers, how the climate change is going to affect the rivers and uh, the, the rain patterns in South America that are so much a part of generating energy, for example. So you have to, to think about adaptation to climate change when you're looking at Latin America and when you're projecting uh, energy and clean energy solutions for Latin America. Um, but also, what's not on this picture are other vulnerabilities. And Latin America is also one of the most unequal regions in the world in terms of wealth and distribution of wealth. And it's also one of the most, ex uh, has the most exclusion, social exclusion in the world. If you look at the Gini coefficient of most countries in Latin America, you'll find them to be very high. And so you have a lot of exclu exclusion, and that means that you have very rich areas, and then you have pockets of a very extreme poverty in the region. Uh, in terms of energy, specifically, uh, zooming in on our, and this is my last slide, zooming in on our, on our topic. Um, huge opportunities, huge opportunities in Latin America for, for renewables. Um, there's only 34 to 35 million people in Latin America without access to, to electricity and energy, which is a lot, which is too much. But when you compare it to some other uh, emerging regions, it actually looks pretty good. Uh, the question is whether uh, Latin America is going to be able to take advantage of its huge potential for renewable energy. Um, as right now, the fastest growing energy uh, in some countries is actually still fossil fuels. And we have several uh, oil giants in, in Latin America. Uh, Venezuela has arguably the largest oil reserves in the world. Uh, you have Mexico, you have Brazil. Brazil is also often mentioned as the future. I mean, Ex Exxon and the, a lot of oil companies use the pre-sal finding of oil off the coast of Brazil as proof that there's going to be oil to take us to mid-century. Um, so there's sort of this uh, balance between the wealth in terms of, of oil and traditional fossil fuel uh, energy and the potential for renewable energy. This is a study from the Inter-American Development Bank. And what it shows is that what they did was they projected energy demand out to 2030. And then they also mapped all the potential for solar, uh, for wind, and other renewables, biomass, in Latin America. And they found that if you compare the potential to the demand, Latin America has 22 times the energy pot potential compared to the demand. And so there's ample renewable energy available for meeting the demand in Latin America without using the, uh, the uh, traditional uh, energy matrix. So the question for us as a Latin American uh, foundation is, this seems like Latin America has a winning hand here. You know, if you look at uh, the clean energy and has a huge potential, will, are they going to get it right? They have the potential to get it right. They could have the potential to be a model for the rest of the world. This is how you do it. Um, and then frankly, with this kind of potential, if you don't get it right, the other message is very strong. If, if Latin America can't do it with all the cards they've been dealt, then we're really, you know, we're, we're, we're in a bad situation. Um, 
So, well, how do you, so how do you contribute to that process where Amer Latin America makes the right decisions about their energy future? And for Avena, the way that we've been participating in that is through policy, through so policy change. For us, it's a, it, if you want to work at scale, you've got to work in po the policies, you have to work in the regulations, you have to change the incentive structures right now that are favoring a, a, a non-sustainable energy future. Uh, and uh, we have several examples of what's been happening in Latin America, very in, uh, initial stages, but that we think uh, offer a lot of hope that that is something that can really uh, lead to a more sustainable future for Latin America. This is a picture of, uh, from Ecuador of the Yasuni region. I don't know if you followed this in the news. It's sort of the example to me of the way you don't want to do energy policy. Top down, uh, making, tr basically selling your environment. If, if you're not familiar with this, basically in Ecuador, they found uh, over 850 million barrels of oil underneath an indigenous reserve in the Amazon that also had the highest biodiversity per hectare in the world. So the question was, do you develop that asset? So the government said, well, I'll tell you what, world, you really like this, you want, like the biodiversity and you want us to respect this? Uh, it's worth seven, uh, 700 billion, no, seven billion, sorry. If you pay us half that, we won't de develop the asset. They raised 100 million. So last year they decided, well, we didn't get the, the trade-off that we were looking for, so we're going to develop the asset. Massive protests, obviously, because the society has come to value that, uh, the protection of that indigenous area and the protection of the environmental wealth there. Um, so there's really a question, and this is just one example. I could talk about dams in Chile, I could talk about uh, uh, dams in Brazil, but there's a real question about the legitimacy of policy decisions and how they're made. Are they made top down? Are they made behind closed doors? Uh, uh, are they, or are they made in participatory processes where people have the, a, the, the chance to participate in defining the energy future? And for us at Avena, uh, the key to good energy policy is a good energy policy formulation process. And the process is very important to having a good outcome. So that's a little bit of what we work in. And I think that uh, some of our partners, uh, uh, two of which are here, uh, will be able to explain better how that works on the ground. So uh, that's the Avena perspective. And I'd like to invite uh, Tasso to, to follow with uh, an example from Brazil. Thank you. So uh, I'm not an expert on energy, so I'm a very curious person on energy. But uh, I feel like pressure to work on this because of what's going on in Brazil right now. So I, I'm, I'll try to convince you that 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 should be that that was the right decision. <laughs> So this is the, uh, the global emissions of greenhouse gases, how it's developed since 1990 when we have the, the agreement, um, the convention. So the convention was supposed to start a process in which we will control and decrease the emissions of a greenhouse gas, but in fact, we are actually increase the, the emissions and increase fast. So we come from 36 gigatons, billions of tons of CO2 equivalent in, uh, in 1990, we are in about 50, 51 right now. And um, we are going towards 60 on the path that we are going right now. Um, that's, that's a lot of carbon. One ton of carbon is how much a car we will emit in one year, or a cattle, one, one animal, or one travel from Sao Paulo to Londres. This economy class would be one ton. So that's, when you talk about 50 billion tons, like 50 billion of any of those things. So it's, <laughs> you know, a big chunk. So, what we learned from the IPCC on the last report, uh, this report that actually the last part of the report will be uh, launched today, um, uh, later today, um, is that uh, we have a budget of how much we can still emit on, on carbon, on, CO, on greenhouse gas measuring on carbon equivalent from now to 2100, which means the end of this century. And this budget is 1,000 
ton, uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalent. So, so that's our budget. That's to have a 66% chance to stay on the two degrees target. Okay? So you know, making a easy you know, making an easy account, 1,000 divided by 90 years, it's more or less 11 gigatons is the average that we have as a budget for to the end of the century. So like the challenge is, you know, not just stop to grow these emissions, <coughs> but we have to push down this very quickly and very, very, very strongly. Um, if, just to have an idea, if we talk about, you know, an average of 33, for example, which is pretty close to what we had in 1990, then we are talking about three, four degrees. You don't want to live in a place, on a world that we have three, four degrees um, more than uh, the average on the temperature. That's a total disaster. Just to have an idea, in New York, this means, if we have four degrees, New York means eight degrees above the, the, the average. Like, no way, you can't survive that. So we, we, we don't have a choice. We have to go to this, to this path. Now, um, so the problem is, it's like a cake, you know? But it's a cake on the end of the party. So you just have this piece of cake. And we have to divide this piece of cake uh, with everybody. But it's a kind of a party where some people are just arriving at the end of the party, and they haven't eaten anything. They, they want to eat something. Some of the people have eaten like three, three slices, and they want to repeat. <laughs> you, you, know, like that's the, you know, that's the problem, right? So the thing is, how we actually divide this piece of cake? No? Um, you know, there is many proposals, like per capita, per country, per sector, blah, blah. You know, many, many ways. I like to choose, I, I always try to think about per capita, because I think that at the end, it's more close to what could be somehow a measure that makes sense for, you know, the human being, since, since it's a human being problem, right? Um, so what is a low carbon economy? It's, it, it's, that's what's written in the top. Right? <laughs> uh, so you see, in 1990, the, the population was 5.3 billion people and uh, the emissions were 35, 36. So we're talking about an emission of 6.6 .6 tons of carbon per person per year in the planet. Now we are about 7.1, you know, that's our emissions today. So what will happen in 2050? If you want to get on the 11 gigatons of uh, CO2 for the, as an average for the whole century we get, we need to get down to 10 gigatons in 2050. So it's coming out from 50 to 10. That's the 80% reduction that we always heard, right? 80% reduction, that's, that's where the numbers come from. So if, if this is true and if we will have 9 billion people in, in um, according to you know, different statistics, uh, say, so, oh, we have 9 billion people in the world, a low carbon economy is actually one ton of carbon per person per year. That's, that's low carbon economy. So you can choose to go Sao Paulo, London once, a year, not going back, then you have to go back next year. <laughs> or you can choose to have a car, or you can choose to eat meat. Yeah, I mean, you choose. But the thing is, it's, it's a dramatic reduction of emissions. That's low carbon economy. If you think about, you know, how much money we make, how much growth we have in, in terms of tonal carbon, we're talking about, you know, $1,200 today, and we need to go to something like $20,000 uh, per ton. That's, uh, that's how we make a, a low carbon economy. Remember those numbers because I will refer to that when I talk about Brazil. Uh, so Brazil is one of the, uh, the eight countries that makes the two-thirds of the global emissions. So we are you know, uh, a big emitter of greenhouse gases. Um, China is the first one there. Um, Brazil is here in the, like, so just very close to Japan. Um, this is the other trends, like China, India, Indonesia is still growing emissions. Um, EU, US start to decrease emissions last year. That was very good. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's for the right reasons, but it's, it's doing. Um, and um, Brazil also, uh, for the results on deforestation and so on. Some other countries are a little bit stabilized, like Russia and, and Japan. But that's, that's where we are. That's where we fit. So Brazil, it's very important for, um, for the emissions, uh, even being a, a developing country. Now, so this is the... The, the story of our emissions from 1990 to 2012. This is part of a project that we have with a, a group of NGOs in Brazil uh, that is producing statistics of all the greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors 
historically in Brazil and make this available very simple for the people. That's uh, part of our project. And then that's to sum up the whole thing for, for the life. And you see that, uh, you know, we have a beautiful story here. No? From 2005 to 2012, we really decreased emissions uh, very impressively. We're actually coming back to the levels of emission that we have in 1990, which is really, even comparing to most of the developed countries, is really, a, you know, a nice story. But if you see the story like this, it's very different. So what you see in the top in orange is actually deforestation, you know, land use change. What you see in the bottom is all the other sectors. So our story is, if you take out deforestation, which is, you know, an, an emission that really doesn't make sense, we should stop anyway. You look at the others and you see that our past is exactly like any other, you know, uh, developing country, just increasing, increasing, and increasing. And you see this in a, in a more closely, like looking for 2005 to 2012, and you see that the, the emissions from, from deforestation dec declined 68%. That's mostly due to the de decline of the, of the deforestation in the Amazon. But the emissions from energy increased 31%. 31%, one third in just seven years. To have an idea, the emissions in the world, in the entire world, I mean, the average growth like 8% in this period. And most of the, the emissions in the world is from energy. So we are growing the emissions on energy very, very quickly. Uh, and the interesting fact is that now, after we decrease the emissions, you know, 36% in the, the last uh, seven years, now we are in the average of the world. Seven tons per, per capita and $1,200 uh, per per ton. So now we are not the bad guys. Like we, we, are, we are average, right? That's, uh, uh, that's where we are. But the decrease of emissions is, is actually stopping because the deforestation now is, is very low. Deforestation is not anymore the, the, the main source of emission. In 2013, we are absolutely sure that energy will be, it's, it's already the, 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 most, the most important source of emission in Brazil, which is kind of a, a completely change because in 2005, it was two thirds of the emission were from, from forest uh, uh, deforestation. Now, so that's the, how we always see Brazilians in international forum, et cetera, talking proudly about our matrix. You see, like, Chile has the, the, the goal to, to be 20% renewable energy. Brazil is, in 2009, was 47.3. In 1990, yeah, it, no, but this is all energy. If we take just up, talk about just about electricity, this is 85. But let's talk about the whole energy, because that's what matters, right? The whole energy is 47 point it was 49 in 1990. So we are, we, we stay like this, you know, 49, 40, 47, something like that. Um, and you can compare with the world. So that's our glass half full, right? Um, so where we are going? See, this is um, how is the composition of our matrix. You see that the reason why we have a lot of uh, uh, renewable is not, we always think about hydro, but in fact, this is biomass is the most important important thing. You think about sugarcane and uh, if you add up sugarcane and, and uh, uh, wood, then we're talking about 25% or something like that. Um, so, but what is happening in the last years is really dramatic. You see from, in 2009, Brazil has the set up a target on, on climate change, on emissions. And one of the things was, for example, to increase the use of bio, uh, biofuels 10% a year. From, from that time to now, we actually decrease 10% a year. From 2009 to now. Increase very <coughs> fast the use of, of, of gasoline instead of ethanol, just as, as an example. Um, the same thing happens uh, with, uh, with energy. So, so you see transportation just like, after we have the target, transportation starts to increase much faster. It's kind of strange, you know? Um, and, and same thing happens with electric energy. So you see here, for example, the, the emissions from uh, the consumption of gasoline and ethanol, which is alcohol, just coming in, in completely different directions just after we actually have the target. Uh, that's the, the emissions from, uh, from electricity. It, it increased seven times 
between 1990 and 2012, seven times. The award didn't double then, so we, and we increased seven times. So it's kind of a, that's, that's, that's our pattern. So the numbers that we have in 2009 actually change in 2012 to 42.2. We lost 5% of our renewable, of the share on renewable energy in just this, um, this period. It's kind of a, we are, I think we're empty the, the, the glass instead of uh, <laughs> fooling the grass. Um, so uh, why this is happening? And I, I, and I think that comes when we start to really thinking on, on working on this. There's three trends happening right now in Brazil that explains a lot of that. The first one is that we don't have a real policy on energy in Brazil. Uh, what we have is plans. And we make plans every year about the energy, looking at the future 10 years ahead, and et cetera. But the plans is more a kind of a prediction of the future. It's not like we want to get there, so we want to plan how to get there. The plan is by basically say, we predict that the future, the demand will be like this, and so we will fulfill the demand like that. And the way you define how you fulfill the demand is looking backwards, saying what had worked before. Now oh, we have this oil, we have this uh, technology, and et cetera, et cetera. And then you use this to go up front. So we are really lacking uh, a, a, a process of vision where we can see where we have to go and then move plan according to, to the challenge that we need to, to achieve. So the second thing is that after we discover this oil, Brazil, most of the investments in Brazil in development is now going to oil. Just to have an idea, for 2010 to 2020, in this decade, the investments on oil will be $500 billion internally from Brazil, apart from what comes from outside. <coughs> in, in solar, um, wind, and, and, uh, and other alternative, alternative use is less than $5 billion. So it's 1%, kind of, a, what the hell? And this, this is just because Brazil have the largest potential on solar energy in the world, the largest potential on wind, energy, the largest potential of biomass, and so on and so on, kind of, you know, Brazil, we used to say in Brazil that God is Brazilian, Th and that's the proof, right? <laughs> they just <laughs> keep everything there, so. Um, but the last point, which I think it's, it's really critical, and right now, this moment in Brazil, people are realizing that very, very clearly, is that climate change in general is seen as a side effect for, for, for the planning on, on energy. And, and not as a main drive of what we have to do. And we are suffering from that right now. Because of the, of the, uh, uh, the unusual dry season that we are having right now, it's simply there is no water in big cities like Sao Paulo. I'm, I'm saying no water is no water. Like the, we are in the end of the raining season, and the reservoirs, the main reservoirs in Sao Paulo are 12% capacity. The end of the rainy season. That's, that's what we have right now. So really, really, really a big, uh, uh, a big situation. So now people are thinking, yeah, we have to figure out how to mix, mix these two things. Like climate change will affect all our agro-power, for example. We will affect our agriculture production. So how can we shift completely the way we are thinking, the planning of energy uh, to get there? So my sense on this is that we should be uh, having as a vision, and that's the, the last point, uh, <laughs> this. The path that we are going right now is that we have an emission of 400 million tons of CO2 from, um, uh, from energy to produce a certain amount of energy. And what will happen on the way we are going right now is that we will emit something like 700 million tons by 2020. That's, uh, that's on the plan of the government. To produce another amount of energy, but it's, it's not growing proportionally. So we are actually increasing the emission per unit of of energy. What we have to do, we have to find a way in which we will limit our emission from energy on something about 200 million, 250 million tons. Why? Because we can't emit more than one ton per, per habitant, per capita in 2050. That should be our, our vision. Like remember that we have to go down very quickly. So we need to get to close to 200 million, but we have to at least double the, the amount of energy that we will have, uh, that we need in Brazil. So that should be the way we will think about our planning. How can we actually meet this uh, um, vision 
uh, by doing planar energy. And that's what we are working, uh, trying to work right, right now on preparing a kind of a plan, alternative plan uh, for energy in Brazil with a vision and, and a plan. And, uh, and those four things will be like key elements for, that we think will drive the way we can get there. Mm -hmm. Electrify the country, just 16% of the energy in Brazil is electricity today. We need to go to about 80%, something like that. We need to completely shift the way we think about the, the, the energy. <coughs> Sun and wind will be the, the key, the core elements of the new energy that we produce in Brazil. Hyperconductivity and cloud storage, which are the new things that are happening right now, will be, uh, that has to be something that we, we work as a reality in 10 years. Like I say, imagine that this will be a reality in 10 years, how we prepare ourselves to, to cope with that. And we have to democratize the energy production. We, we have today in Brazil, everyone can have access to energy to consume the energy. Now we have to invert that. We have to find a ways in which we can, you know, give the people the power to produce their energy, decentralize that. And that will be like the four key elements. That's it. Thank you very much to be here. I, I will not go to the figures because I think that all these days we look a lot of figures and uh, the, only, the only thing I, I, I want to, to agree because Tasso present very well what's happened in Brazil, probably the only difference with Chile is that the only country in Latin America that uh, energy sector is the main uh, a CO2 emissions uh, uh, sector. It's not a change of uh, land or deforestation. And uh, so I, I want to uh, take advance of the opportunity here uh, to really go more deeply on the uh, cultural and political challenges we face. That is not only a, a technology challenge. Uh, technology is part of the challenge we face to um, to, uh, to really go and, uh, and allow to create a new future in terms of energy. Uh, but it's not only uh, technology responses. There are some, as Tasso said in the last part, there are some kind of uh, uh, social and political structure. Is, uh, is, uh, is the idea on what we, uh, we think um, in terms of energy, it's, uh, it's only a service that uh, can be driven by the market, or probably we can uh, decommodify some sectors of the energy services. So I think that we are uh, today in a, in a very crucial moment to rethink completely how the planet is uh, uh, planning and strategize in terms of uh, energy. So. I, I, I tried to answer the two questions uh, that uh, um, make the panel for, to us, and I want to go to the first one. And uh, what are the, the, the main drivers to, to transform the energy matrix? And, and, and I think that uh, first thing is the, is the, um, the traditional drivers, as I said before. Um, the first confirmation for us in the case of Chile and in several countries in Latin America is that uh, we need to go beyond uh, the, uh, the state and the market inertia. I think that we, uh, we really are in a situation where um, we face a political failure. Uh, we we ha uh, have no the capacity uh, inside the convention to decarbonize the world energy matrix and to reverse global warming. Um, post Copenhagen, the world accept to have two more degrees, and all you know what it means for people, countries, uh, natural resources, uh, human communities, and so on. So I think that the first really concrete thing is that uh, um, we need to go far from this uh, um, solely state uh, and market uh, uh, driven um, as uh, the main actors of the, of the, uh, of, of, the um, of the problem or to solve the problem. Second, uh, second thing that is very clear today is that uh, technology is ready. 
uh, is ready to really spread everywhere and go very rapidly on this. And probably we can achieve, as Tasso said. <coughs> but the problem is that uh, the for-profit focus and the competitive conditions of regulations became serious obstacles to really uh, go uh, in the speed um, and in the time we need to solve uh, the problem. The second, the second um, family of evidence uh, that uh, uh, from the civil society we really see, uh, think is that uh, we need uh, to take the lead as, uh, um, as people in the world. And, and we need really to go from the concept and the behavior of energy consumers to energy citizenship. And this is not go and automatically plug the lag and those, all these things. But I think that uh, energy, uh, energy citizenship is uh, it's really have the conscience of uh, universal access to energy services for in life, if for is as, as the same of water and the same of food, it's really uh, a key, absolutely key. Um, Second, that it's, uh, it's more important or the, the central thing in terms of uh, energy, um, energy decision need to be informed participation over technocracy and for profit approach. So we need some kind of energy rebellion <laughs> from people to really uh, overpass this for profit and competitive uh, uh, approach is an obstacle we will not solve the situation we are now. And, uh, and the third thing in, the, in this, uh, that composes this energy citizen concept is to go from consumerism to radical efficiency and conservation culture. Because of course, uh, the, the world as we see, continue growing, 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 growing. So our only possibility is to put more offer, more offer, more offer, it's, it's <coughs> impossible. So if you really don't go radical in terms of uh, um, uh, management um, control and managed policy, it's impossible to solve the situation. The third one is, uh, uh, and for several sectors, we need to de decommodify and deconcentrate uh, energy resources, production and services. Uh, energy is not only a commodity, energy is an environmental good rather than an and, and the commodity for uh, several sectors, for homes, for food production uh, in local communities. Probably can be a community, f a, a, a commodity for a for-profit activity as mining or others. But there are some sectors where energy need to be a service that is completely managed by other, uh, other framework than the market one or the competitive one. Um, we need a, a radical efficiency approach, demand management policies, more than con uh, com uh, continue increasing the offer of energy. And uh, uh, we, we need really to go from economic concentration, energy production to smart decentralized system. <coughs> And this is, uh, uh, this is so important because uh, it's one of the way where you can uh, decommodify energy services and put energy service and production and consumption outside the market. Some things can continue in the market, but probably the majority can go outside the market and with another logic. What's, uh, uh, what we work in the last, uh, uh, in the last years in Chile, um, we take, um, we take the, um, a very um, pressure role uh, after the natural gas crisis with Argentina, where the country really uh, faced uh, scarcity in terms of uh, um, energy. Uh, and the first, we, um, we take this crisis as an opportunity and uh, in uh, 
2004, we obtained the first uh, um, um, non-renewables energy law. We put inside the law definitions and guarantee uh, the new, <coughs> these new energies uh, access to the grid. Before the situation, they have no access to the grid. Um, in the 2008, uh, we obtained a mandatory quota of uh, 5% in, in 2010 uh, and 10% 2024. In the year 2010, uh, we, um, uh, we achieved the creation of a Ministry of Energy. The country have no Ministry of Energy at this time. It's only mining. That is um, the star sector of our economy. So energy run. Uh, serving mining, but have no, uh, the country have no an energy policy. So the creation of the minister was so important. We put inside uh, an energy renewables energy center and an efficiency agency to have the two arms for the future energy policy. And then in the 2011, we create the national energy efficiency plan with a goal of uh, 15, um, percent energy efficiency in 10 years. So you can obtain this 15 um, uh, percent of uh, the energy demand from efficiency and not new, new power plants. And uh, at last, last year, we uh, obtain and push with a mandatory quota of 20 percent in the year 2025. Why? Because from the year 2008 and in the year 2012, we see that the market go more rapidly than the uh, mandatory quota we put in the year 2008. So it's ridiculous in terms of uh, pricing of energy to have a very conservative uh, a mandatory quota. And I think that in all the countries of Latin America, because of the natural resources that uh, Xi'an uh, shows in the first uh, transparency, it's very clear that all the country will go very fast on this. <coughs> Lastly, uh, what are the, um, the challenge we face in this moment? Because the first stage is to solve uh, or try to begin to solve the emissions problem and the, and the local uh, dirty energy uh, impacts in <coughs> environmental, in health, people health, and so on. The second one is, uh, is to go through equity. And, uh, and for us, in terms of legislation, that is our focus is facing uh, market distortions. Uh, our first work in uh, the year 2004 is uh, equity in payment and tarification, that we have no this uh, equity before. Uh, then a free transfer in grid for little uh, renewables, uh, less than nine megawatts. And, uh, and also uh, in, the two, uh, in, the, in the two years ago, a law for the residential uh, renewable generation, net metering law, that allows some people to really uh, go outside the grid and uh, connected, but uh, really autonomous in terms of energy. And today we have in Congress uh, two, uh, two laws in the same, um, in the same line. First is a green tax for thermoelectric plants uh, emissions for CO2, but also for local pollutants. And uh, designing with the government in this moment is deconcentration to stop the monopoly of three country, uh, three companies uh, that uh, controls 85% uh, of the generation. So um, probably uh, in the next year we will have uh, this law in the Congress. And the second one is uh, transparency in commercialization and tarification. So put all the information uh, in terms of the energy market uh, under the, the public. What are the, um, the components uh, where we design uh, energy, uh, energy policy uh, from uh, the people's perspective or the energy citizenship is, uh, is that uh, all new energy policy need to accomplish energy democracy, as uh, Tasso said before. Then energy equity, uh, that is absolutely key. And of course, energy uh, sustainability in terms of environment or in natural uh, resources. This is uh, 
this is more or less uh, most uh, um, civil society thinking, but uh, let's say that it's completely uh, possible to go with this approach to official policy of governments. And you can pass laws inside the Congo with this vision because current um, logic and, and framework for uh, energy policy is not facing climate change is not facing uh, equity problems and poverty, and of course, is not facing uh, the sustainability of the natural resources. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, so I think uh, since we're already an hour into it, we should probably switch to the discussion as quickly as possible, but um, I think I'll take a few minutes uh, to, to talk about a couple of specific things. Um, Tasso told the story well, and uh, we had initially thought we'd be a little controversial on the panel and try to create some, something exciting, but we made the mistake of getting together on Wednesday and kind of solving all these problems. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and Tasso told me, don't talk about anything else, just talk about solar, because that's the solution. So <laughs> I've, I've, switched to, I've switched my slides to basically get to the point quickly, uh, even though it's, 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 it's more solution-oriented. And with apologies to Sarah, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few numbers, uh, just because very often I hear that you know, all these problems that Tasso and Sarah teed up are really not very easily solvable, because either the technology is not ready, or it's too expensive, or it's going to take 20 years, or most people in the world can't afford it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all these uh, arguments for leaving you know, the incumbent solutions in place. And I just want to touch on a couple of things to basically say, I think uh, there are many, many options to solve this problem, and, uh, and, and I think the time is right. And then the second thing is just the scale of the of the problem is very large. Uh, so this is not something uh, that, is a, that is a small issue, and it's not something that uh, you know, just one country in Latin America or just, this, just the continent of Latin America has to face. The, the numbers get very large very quickly, no matter which way you look at it, whether it's from a social and public policy side or poverty, or even uh, you know, the capitalistic investment uh, opportunity side. And, and uh, I think Tasso talked a little bit about it, but if you look at as some of these countries make this journey up the development index and you compare them, compare their per capita electricity use, there is a, just a huge story unfolding as these countries make this journey. And even if these countries do this twice as efficient as the West or three times as efficient as the West, it is going to dwarf uh, what our existing energy use is by the time these appetites are met. So the numbers are incredibly large, uh, trillions of dollars um, uh, involved. And uh, uh, Tasso had a picture on this, but just from numbers point of view, uh, in a country like China, I think your, 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 your figure cut off, it's only about a tenth, and in India, it's only about a thirtieth per capita. And from emissions point of view, China is already the largest and India is already the fourth largest. So these, these countries have barely made it on the map of this curve, and they're already some of the largest emitters. So again, the scale is very, very large. Um, by the way, that's, an, uh, that's one of my favorite pictures of, a, of, a, of an average freeway in China on an average day. Um, so. Uh, the good news is, for those who are looking to solve this problem and, and, and people looking for an opportunity to go solve it, there is huge growth uh, that, is, that is going to happen here. And most of that growth is in the geographies that we are talking about today. Because the rest of the world has actually flattened out in terms of energy use with a combination of population and a combination of efficiency and a combination of you know, things fairly uh, plateauing out. And this tells you know, a story in, in a thousand points of light, if you, pick, if you please. Uh, the opportunity to do all of this is, you know, all the way here. And Latin America is obviously um, included in that. Uh, just another way to look at it, I won't dwell on this, but uh, uh, this, this, this shows that these are the regions to care about because that's where the access to electricity is going to change over the next 
few years, uh, over the next decades, and going to the conclusion that the, that the, that the panel made before we met you <laughs> is that uh, one very easy way to solve this and a solution at hand is indeed uh, solar energy. And uh, uh, a lot of the world is blessed with very good solar resources. And that overlap of access of energy and where solar is very good um, is, at, you know, is available to us today. Um, solar was a wonderful gift from Germany to us, uh, even though Germany is not exactly the best location for, for solar energy. But that's really uh, what was responsible for this massive uh, scale up that happened over the last 10 years, which is a wonderful thing. And we saw uh, a phenomenal drop in solar prices. Uh, very rarely, uh, in fact, almost never have we seen a reduction in the cost of a source of energy by 5x. Um, somebody, somebody reminded me on, on, on Monday that natural gas prices in the US have fallen. Uh, and yes, that is one element of it. But that's very concentrated. And that's one element of the fuel. And solar has done this in the last 10 years as we watched with the price of solar plummeting uh, because uh, the world rushed to solve this. And while there's been blood on the streets for many solar companies, this is something that uh, has, has completely changed the way people think about uh, alternative energy. And this is not something that is going to reverse like we see these trends in, in, in other parts of uh, electronics. And as a result of it, uh, I think the point that I want to make is this is not something we have to wait for. This is not a technology problem. This is well beyond the tipping point. And there are many, many, many markets in the world now where solar energy is competitive or cheaper than grid electricity. So those days of waiting for when the grid will solve this problem or when the grid will be cleaned up or when we can do that has, has, has gone by the way of the mobile phone where most of the world is not waiting for landlines or infrastructure to be built. Uh, they have simply switched to mobile phones and, and, and a better solution, a better mousetrap, and a more economically viable mousetrap. So this, I think, is, 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 is a big piece of the solution and, and something we can do today. And uh, no surprise, uh, you know, you have studies appearing everywhere all of a sudden in the last couple of years. I think this is now two years old, uh, or yeah, two years old uh, in terms of, you know, what size of markets and where this can happen. Uh, and I think another one is about to come out here in the next few months. So a lot of people are echoing this. A lot of people are admiring this. And uh, I think we need to, uh, you know, take some of Tasso's and Sarah's suggestions and, and get on with it. So I'll stop here and maybe we can switch to discussion. Thank you very much. Fantastic. If you could come and sit down. Uh, because of the time, I think that, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, we're, we're not doing so good on time. I would like to uh, just ask one question of the panel, if I could. Uh, taking advantage of my position. Uh, and then we'll open up for, for questions from, from you all. But the, uh, the main question that was put to us when they invited us onto this, into this discussion group was, what are the main drivers to a clean energy matrix? And we've seen several drivers mentioned. But some of the drivers are policy change. Some of the drivers are uh, citizen rebellion, basically. Some of the drivers are market. Um, I'd just like to hear, you know, briefly from you, what do you see as like some of the main drivers that are actually going to make, help us make this curve happen? I guess you can start. Um, but, you know, I think I, I use the example of Germany. Uh, I think Germany was an example where public policy played a huge role, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, you had the population of Germany get up and say, we're willing to pay a little more. Uh, ahead of the curve uh, and uh, switch to uh, a cleaner form of energy. So I think that's a great example of where public policy mm -hmm. played a role, uh, obviously in a region where people could afford it. Nice. Um, I think what you're seeing now is in other parts of the world, market forces taking over because uh, it is the best market option or the best market solution. I use the analogy to mobile 
right. telephony. And I think it's very, very similar where uh, because of uh, the many ways in which governments are failing uh, people in infrastructure and policy, people are basically solving these problems while the government sleeps. Mm -hmm. Again, back to the mobile telephony example. And so I think there it's largely market forces uh -huh. in spite of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the absence of government. But that could also be a citizen rebellion, right? If well, I think that uh, without public policies it's really difficult because mm -hmm. it's the common rules. Uh -huh. But how you go to these public policies? Right. And I think that in this moment, where we, we face uh, climate change uh, difficulties to face, mm -hmm. Tasso showed very clear for me, Brazil is an example of China, is an example of, of uh, India, and so on. Brazil, India, and China. You can imagine if the three countries, plus the United States, mm -hmm. really don't do their task, mm -hmm. well, the situation, it's impossible. So you, you really uh, can't afford, you, we, we weighed the states mm -hmm. from 92 to now, and now we are accept two more mm -hmm. grades. Mm -hmm. So if we continue, probably we will arrive to four, as you show. Mm -hmm. So without, uh, without people mm -hmm. pushing for public policies, we, we will not have uh, public policies to really run the solution mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as the Spencer said, we cannot imagine the future as was the past. Because probably we don't need grids <laughs> in several uh, sectors. In Germany, in Germany today, more or less 30% of the energy Solar, wind is produced by school, mm -hmm. rural cooperatives. There are no companies, mm -hmm. traditional companies. Mm -hmm. There are enterprises, mm -hmm. but there are, are no traditional companies. So I think that with, without civil or, or citizen uh, um, um, energy uh, citizenship, we cannot participate or change market change the way of government is, uh, is looking public policy and really uh, get the speed to the process that we need. Right. Uh. What do you think, Tasso? Is, uh, well, this is the best thing that could, I mean, the only thing that then would be one shot would be like if we change the president. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> very simple. <laughs> change the president, because in our case it's like, uh, the she was the minister of, uh, of <laughs> energy and she had one idea of how this should work and etc. But let's suppose that we are not, talking about directly about that, because it's, it's not a coup or something like that. <laughs> but I say, there is two things I think, uh, two levels we have tracked. One, we have to challenge what is the planning process of energy in Brazil. This is something that is done very close, like it's like a commission of, you know, few people inside the ministry, they take decisions, there's absolutely no participation. The only thing they do is that every year they have this plan for the next 10 years, and they, you know, put up this plan on October, November for public consultation, and then people can send some ideas and et cetera, but nobody has the tools that they have to, um, to argue. So they, anything that you say, they will argue, now. it's what not work because of the matrix of, you know, like the system, it's very complicated, et cetera, you don't understand anything. Right? <laughs> and at the end, it stays exactly like it was there. So I think one thing is that we have to break this, and uh, that's something we're trying to, we, we, last year we tried to understand how they make the plan, like really put people inside and what's the program, how they use that, et cetera. So maybe we can find out how we can actually make a kind of a plan B. And every year when they show up with the one plan, we, we show up the second plan and say, well, there is alternative. So that's one thing. So challenge the big picture. That's one side. The other, the other side is every, we have to find, uh, yeah. like small gaps in which we can enter with the new technology showing that actually it's a bad business for Brazil, the choice that we are doing. Right. So it, it happens um, in 2009, it happens with wind. Like was everybody saying, well, we need to have one specific auction for wind uh, energy. And, uh, and the, the, the minister never said, no, no, it's very expensive. This is 300 reais per megawatt and for uh, uh, electricity is 120. So no chance. But after a lot of in insistence, then they said, okay, well, let's make one auction, you know, here, a small one just for, for wind. 
And after, after one year, the price of wind energy was actually below hydropower. Now we have to make auctions specifically for wind just to guarantee that they will not win all the competition because wind is cheaper than, yeah. than hydropower. So kind of it's too competitive. So I think that we should, we need to find a way to actually, you know, show up, for example, solar in a different way. So it's kind of uh, the two ways. Great. Fantastic. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, let's see. Well, I, I saw you first, so we'll start. Thank you. Uh, Nathan Wilcox with the Skull Global Threats Fund. And my question is for Tasso. You have a, um, a couple of rather large sporting events coming up in your country in the near future uh, between the Olympics and the World Cup. And large, <laughs> <laughs> yes, hopefully, um, large infrastructure expansions can either be a blessing or a curse in terms of moving to a sustainable energy future. So I'm just curious on your take as between either the government or the NGO sector or the private sector efforts to actually make sure that all the roads that are being built, all the new energy supplies, all the buildings that are going up for these massive things, is it being done in a way that actually is keeping in mind the desire to make a more sustainable energy future? So in short, is this going to help or hurt the path towards a more sustainable energy future for Brazil? Well, to be honest, if you, if you read the news, you see that the only things, for example, for the World Cup, the only thing that will be ready for the World Cup is the stadiums. Some of them are not ready, and the World Cup is in two months. So all the infrastructure are not even close. Like, the only thing, maybe uh, airports and so on. So in terms of really having something uh, important to be built and new, et cetera, it's, it's not having a big effect. It will have on the city of Rio de Janeiro for the Olympics. That's another story. But the point is, what we are uh, suffering now is that the fact that we are struggling on so bad use of the money on the investments that we are doing in the stadium <laughs> that should not be used on, I mean, we are using $10 billion to build stadiums, <coughs> which, you know, why we don't use this for making the infrastructure and so on. So I think that that's, so in, in terms of the energy, it, it don't really make any, any, there is nothing happening in energy because of these events. Whether the events will be there or not, will not make a, a big difference. Apart from one thing, that now, because we have less water on the reservoirs and so on. They are just turning on all the thermal power plants in full uh, for the whole year, just to guarantee that there is no blackout during, during the, the games. But in, in apart from that, it's just like, um, it's not having an effect directly. Uh, let's see. Let's go to this side, in the red sweater. Uh, thank you, this is a question for Sara and Tasso. Um, what was striking to me was, uh, in your presentations, there was no mention of the uh, intergovernmental negotiations on climate. Um, so I'm wondering um, if that's because they are now totally irrelevant from your perspective, um, or, or if they are relevant, and how, and how your work on energy policy in your countries is going to impact your country's position in the negotiations in Lima coming up, and then when there's supposedly going to be a new agreement in Paris um, next year. Um, and how those that, that agreement might actually impact your country's energy policies as well, so both ways. Well, in, um, in, in our case, uh, we use uh, um, uh, as one of the arguments, um, our country put a voluntary um, uh, um, target of 20% uh, uh, related to the year 2007 em seven emissions. So we use these as, uh, um, as one of the arguments to uh, push the law to obligate to have a mandatory quota of 20% of uh, new renewables for the year 2025. Um, in this moment, uh, we will arrive probably with the traditional renewable that is uh, uh, wood and, uh, and um, uh, hydro, plus the new renewables, we will arrive to 60%. Um, the country can go, uh, looking at our figures, to 75% of uh, new renewables. And then hydro can continue being 20, so we can need, uh, in terms of competitive prices of the energy, we can only have 5% of natural gas. So we can be 
practically complete renewables in very short uh, term. But uh, in our countries, uh, it's, it's really difficult to put the, the argument of climate change. So more or less we use uh, local pollution and health problem as the pushing um, forces to uh, clean up the, the, the energy matrix. Any well, I think expectations. This, is, this is for me, this is like the starting point. So um, the whole thing we are thinking about this year, for example, is how we actually use the fact that on 31st March next year, all countries have to present their um, contributions for whatever will be the regime after 2020 as a way to have, a, to have Brazil to think about what could be our space of carbon in 2050. And based on this space of carbon, that meets this budget to think about how much this could be energy. And so we have to rethink about energy based on, the, on this limit that we have on, so, so it's actually it's really on the, on the main uh, debate, the, the ne negotiation. One, one element that I'd uh, be curious to hear about, Sarah, is that you mentioned, and I completely understand that it's hard for uh, some countries to do this on the basis of climate change. It has to be on local factors like pollution and and uh, other local issues, which I completely agree with. Has there been much in Latin America around local issues like the improvement in the eco economy and uh, employability and sort of new economic uh, impetus because you move to these types of uh, industries and that creates a lot of local jobs and, and, uh, and, 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 and as opposed to an import-based energy policy? Well, in the case of Chile, it's, uh, it's very clear. Uh, because uh, when you build a big plant, hydro or coal and so on, you have very little employment and a lot of uh, um, impacts in terms of flooding valleys and uh, in terms of air pollution and in terms of uh, pollution of the, of the sea where we have uh, uh, fisheries communities and so on. And in this case, uh, uh, we go uh, w for more employments but at the same time to build an escalation of uh, um, um, different kind of industries because uh, the country have a lot of mining technologies. All the, all the industry that, uh, that we, you, you use to build the, the towers for the wind, for example, you have people in place so you can have this capacity from mining to energy. And, and really uh, have uh, another, uh, another industry mm -hmm. that is uh, it's, uh, less pollution, uh, um, so it's, uh, uh, it's a solution for environment, it's a solution for job creation, it's a solution for the, uh, the, the exacerbate extractivism of natural resources. So it's really an opportunity for development mm -hmm. to, to, to really go from natural resources extraction as 70 or 80 percent of your economy to some kind of level of industrialization linking with the new technologies for energy and at the same time to use all the solar potential of the Atacama Desert, for example. Um, how are we on time? Are we okay? Okay, let's uh, do one more question. Yes? <coughs> Guidon Bro Bromberg from Ecopeace, Friends Earth Middle East. I want to speak to the um, absurdity of looking at South America to the Middle East. So San Paolo is running out of water. Israel has more water than it knows what to do with because of desalination, a technological uh, uh, change on the ground. And the Middle East is, I in the ecological footprint you showed, uh, is way overusing. Yet it's blessed with sun and it's not using it at all. So um, I'd like to throw out a challenge, and that's a challenge that we're working on, is how do we get the water energy nexus right? And how can we do it right in the Middle East? So that the energy of the Levant, which has no oil, becomes solar, that uh, runs the desalination plants that produce the water that's missing, and in the process create uh, a stability because it's the, uh, it's the coastal areas, Israel in particular, that can produce the water, but it's the desert and it's the Arab countries that has the, have the desert lands to produce the energy. So energy, water, and Middle East peace. If anyone can help us do that, <laughs> we're here.
Okay, great. Uh, we'll, we'll the headline, Brazil solves <laughs> Middle East peace. We'll get, we'll get to work on that right after the World Cup, right? Uh, any other question? Maybe one more question, I think. Yes. Um, oh, wait, the microphone. Yeah. Um, I think that it's the energy citizenship uh, rebellion sounds to me like a really great thing to scale up in Latin America and that lead up to Rio and presidential elections. I just wanted to hear from the panelists um, if you have any suggestions for the lessons learned around civil society engagement on energy, maybe from Chile f to for Brazil. Well, in, in all cases, happen these uh, these citizen rebellion happens in the streets, this huge demonstration against the dams that will, will, will plan it to flow all Patagonia rivers. Patagonia, you know, is some kind of space in the world where it has Amazonas, but, but there is glaciers, mountains, so it's some kind of icon of beauty. And uh, so people don't want that uh, current development eat all the things and devast completely. And the first step is to go and use water for cheap energy, and then you have uh, mining, aluminum, all this kind of stuff. So we have people in the city, when, they, when the country approved in, uh, in the year 2011, uh, approved this project, well, all the street of the capital is uh, it's full of people, and also in other cities of the country. So the government said, oh, from where are these people? It's emerging. So, but because people don't want to accept the same thing that they offer in the past for the future. People don't want to, uh, to accept uh, energy development that continue destroying territories, at the same time destroying local economies. So what's happened, and, and because uh, Chile's uh, way to plan energy was is really bad. They are the first law where the, the government can put some orientation. But before this, how you, ha you, you plan uh, the, the, um, the energy future in terms of electricity is that the three companies look their portfolios and said that this I will get more profit with this project, this and this, and this other country does these three. And they said to the government that they will build these plants. And the government put in the list, <laughs> and this is our energy future. You can imagine, have no legitimacy. And for this time, and because of the planning process are some kind of technocratic things, people don't want this. People don't want to decide what are the energy development of the country in their territories, because the plants and the externalization, of course, is in the territories, in the, near their cities, near their, their countryside, and so on. So really, uh, what's happened is that uh, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of di uh, different uh, parts of the crisis explode in one moment, and this gives a lot of opportunity to question market distortions, monopolies, this kind of planification, uh, this, uh, uh, this critical thing, those who is driving the, the, uh, the energy development in terms of electricity. So in this moment, this allowed to us to go a lot of power to the Congress and to the government. And in this moment, we are also negotiating with a, the with a new government, what will be the agenda? And, and the government, uh, know that they cannot continue with the same because people today is going to uh, the justice. So the companies cannot build the project in the territories because people is completely uh, under the rebellion. And they use uh, demonstration, but they use the justice. And they, they, uh, they success in a lot of cases in the last years, not only in, in uh, energy, but also in mining. So today, need to be a new dialogue inside the society, and the corporations need to uh, accomplish the new rules. The same things happened in Brazil with the Belo Monte Dam and now the Tapajós and the Madeira. There's been protests. Um, you know, there's a 
in the in the case of Brazil, uh, Tasso, yeah. is there a way to turn the protests against dams into four uh, four think, renewables? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's let's say the difference in Brazil. There was a lot of protests with Belo Monte, Madeira, etc. Would be thousand people, two thousand people, three thousand. If we are very lucky to get a lot of people um, moving on that. Although we have a lot of interest in the topic, but in one day, when there was a threat on the money from oil to the state of Rio de Janeiro, they put 100,000 people in the streets. Say, oh, the, the, the money of the oil is ours, so we should not divide. The money that we don't have yet, <laughs> so the money that we suppose we'll have yeah. in the future, the decision how to divide the money, if the money will go to all the states or just for some of the states and so on. So I'm just giving an idea what, what it means oil right now in Brazil. It's like, it's, as a strategy of development, it, uh, it, it's very ex easy to explain how it creates jobs. Because, you know, to start up the oil business, you need to make, you know, all the infrastructure and so on. And so you create a lot of jobs. So that's, you know, the meaning is this one, you know, this big thing that's creating a lot of jobs and development. There will be this package of money mm -hmm. at the end that we will have our sovereign funding and so on. And one thing that they did very smart is that at the end, they link the money for health and education to, uh, to oil. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of created a, a, it's an incredible situation that now the money from education and health will depend on oil. It's crazy. It's completely crazy. <laughs> so, but that's 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 where we are right now. Right. Now, the so it's it's difficult for this side that we have a you know a, a problem. To get. So the people who just realize that this is a problem when they realize that we will not use the, all this oil, that the money will not be there. That's that's that I think how we have to to approach that. Um, that's the, that's one side. The other side of, which is very difficult now for most of our organizations uh, work in the civil society, that there's two factors. One is that the government is always playing this game, saying, you know, we, we, we need more energy. You see, you now we have this lack of water, etc., um, and we need to you know, couple with the demand of energy, etc. If we can't use big hydropowers, because it's a base energy, and etc., we have to go to thermal power plants. There's no option. The only option is thermal power plants because solar and wind are too, uh, you know, it's not stable, blah, blah. And thermal power plants, we have to go to coal. Because coal, it's fine, it's, it's or, or gas. And then it's kind of, kind of a putting the, the uh, try to pin the picture that actually we are the ones that are against renewable because we don't want to see these big dams in the Amazon. But the big dams are a disaster happening right now. So we, what we see happening in Rondonia State, it's, <laughs> it's just amazing. The dam, it's a flat area. You make a dam in a flat area, when it starts to go up the river, it's like the area that's, that is um, impacted right now with people dying, et cetera, it's amazing. So I think we're starting to see, uh, to, to be able to have the elements, unfortunately, because we are suffering, to show the elements that we have to rethink the way uh, we're talking. But but now this, this is one problem. The second thing for the civil society, which is very important, is that we, w we didn't get used in our history to deal with the energy sector. Because of the situation, we are always talking about, you know, I'm a forester, you know, like talking with, you know, protecting the forest, decreasing deforestation, a big emission, blah, 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 protection, biodiversity, protect areas, and so on and so on. And energy was a kind of something that was there, it was a problem, we have to take care of, but we didn't really, really understand how they plan, how they think, who are the players, and so on and so on. I think in the last three years, we start to realize that actually we, ha we have to get involved in that. So even me, a forester, I don't care. So I have to understand it. I want to know how they work. I want to influence, to influence them. We need to train ourselves. So um, two years ago, we started up a, a uh, coalition of organizations called the uh, Working Group on Infrastructure and Energy in Brazil, which is basically like that. Everybody's interested on this topic. None of us know anything about this. But we are trying to understand, learning, talk with different people, bring experts to, to explain, tap into the different ways and how they're thinking to see if we can actually come up with something um, that is an alternative, not just for ourselves, but for the society, for the media, for, for the debate, which we don't have nowadays in Brazil. OK, I think we have to leave it there. A clear message, though, that we all, as citizens, need to get involved in this and pressure our governments and make these policy changes happen because price is not the, the barrier. Uh, the technology is already there. So it's really just the political will to make the changes. So thank you very much to the team, and thank you all for doing this.